Hi and welcome. This is the breakout session on stress management and well-being for the graduate school orientation. Give me a second, I'm getting my share screen. There it is. I am Dr. Hazel Lane with the UTSA Counseling and Mental Health Services. Um, welcome and welcome to UTSA. Congratulations on entrance into your graduate program. I am going to be a little honest with you. I am not familiar with talking to myself while doing presentations, so this is a little different for me. Just bear with me as we go through it. Um, so let's start with what it looks like to be in graduate school. Um, graduate students in general experience many of the same mental health concerns, struggles that undergrad students experience. However, it's amplified to some degree because the graduate program itself, most graduate programs can be more stressful than an undergraduate study. Um, so some of the adjustment issues may be very similar to what you or others experienced in your undergrad. Others will be different. And the experience is generally more intense in grad school. Um, most of us who go to grad school have a tendency want to be perfect. We want to be really show that we can do this. We're really invested, which can lead to an increase in our stress and anxiety. Um, very likely you're gonna experience some new stressors in grad school. If you experience high stress or anxiety in undergrad, you are much more likely to experience it again in grad school. Um, students may feel down, may become depressed. Any pre-existing mental health issues can also be amplified, magnified. Um, now, I'm not saying this because I want to scare you or I want you to go running away from the graduate program. Just the opposite. I'm giving you this information so that you can be prepared and help your graduate school experience be even better. Um, so let's look at some of the possible stressors, adjustments. Being a graduate student in and of itself is an adjustment. Um, you have different expectations from professors. Your classes are of a different format. <clears throat> a lot of us experience that imposter syndrome. We look at others and we think, oh, they know so much more than me. They've got, they do, they've got it together. I don't. Yeah, keep in mind you don't know what's going on in their head. Um, Sometimes we can look pretty good on the outside, but there's a lot going on on the inside. Others may see you as having it all together and that you are more advanced in your training than they are. So be careful with the social comparisons. You may be returning to work after having be returning to school after having taken a break to work. Um, so you're readjusting to being a student. And graduate students are much more likely to be working a full-time job especially those who have come back after they've taken a break. So you're also balancing different things in addition to being a student. Um, a, such as you may be new to San Antonio. Uh, you may be the first time you've been away from home. If you did your undergraduate program close to home, this may be a new adventure for you where you're further away from home. Maybe the first time you're on your own. Um, if you lived in the dorm, that's one type of being on your own, and now you're going to have a whole different experience. Some of our students, welcome to you, may have gone away for their undergrad and are now coming home. Their family's here in San Antonio, and they're having to readjust to living with parents or siblings. Um, this can be a pretty stressful situation, especially for those parents who, yeah, you're in grad school, but they still treat you like you're in high school. Um, so we're aware that happens. You also are more likely as a graduate student to be in a long-term committed relationship, including a lot more of our graduate students are married than our undergrad students. And I don't just mean numbers, there's fewer graduate students than undergrad, but the percentage is higher. The percentage of graduate students in a long-term committed married relationship is much higher than the percentage of undergrads. And the percentage of you who have children is also much higher than the percentage of undergrads who have children. So, you know, when you think about all of this, you're adjusting to being a grad school, all the new expectations, the new experiences, you're in a different place in your life, and those are combining to possibly add a lot of stress to your situation. 
So what is stress? Stress is a normal response when we feel threatened or we're kind of off balance in some way. <clears throat> and for those of you in the science field or even those of you who aren't, you probably have picked this up colloquially, um, the stress response is our way of protecting ourselves and it's the fight, flight, freeze. That's what we're talking about. I'm not gonna go into the science about it. We're talking about, for those who are in biology, maybe even kinesiology, we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic, parasympathetic systems. So what we're talking about, and right now we're talking about the sympathetic system being activated with the fight, flight, freeze. So this is how I know I'm stressed. It's the moment when I have so much to do that all I want to do is take a nap and avoid it all. That tells me I have reached my limit on my coping strategies. We all get there, even psychologists. So, so some of the common stressors for graduate students, I am keeping this limited to this particular group. Um, your academics is going to probably be a big stressor. As I said earlier, there's gonna be a, do a lot of different expectations from your professors. Um, and I don't necessarily mean that the work's gonna get harder. <clears throat> I frequently talk to students about, you know, when we went from elementary to middle school, we all got this big hype about how it's gonna be so different. We got to middle school and we survived. You know, again, we got to eighth grade or whatever the end of middle school, junior high was, and there's all this hype about how, what high school's gonna be like. And we did fine. And same between high school and college, it's gonna be the same between undergrad and grad. Intellectually, knowledge-wise, you're fine probably. In fact, I suspect you wouldn't be here if you weren't fine. The difference in academics is the way it flows, what they want. Most masters and doctoral programs are looking at not just giving you academic information, they're looking at training you to be a professional in the field. And that is a different type of learning. That's a different type of stress. It comes with this different type of expectations. You're probably also going to experience or be dealing with or have recently experienced some major life changes. You've got work going on. Um, I wish I could say that all relationships survive graduate programs. They don't necessarily. However, a lot do can be a strain on relationships. So relationships can then in turn put a strain on you. Financial problems are also fairly common. Being too busy. I hear this a lot. I experienced this a lot when I was in grad school, that between classes and research and other commitments, there's just no time left. Children and family. Even if you don't have children, your, your family, extended family can have they just don't always understand what it's like to be a graduate student. Well, you were able to do this as an undergrad, why can't you do it now? And they may not even use the under term undergrad. Um, so unless someone in the family has been through grad school, they can, there can be some issues with them understanding what you're dealing with. Internally, you're, one of the things that causes anxiety is the inability to accept uncertainty. Um, wow. At this point in time, we have lived through about four months of the most extreme uncertainty I think most of us have gone through. I'm sure there's some who've gone through worse, but for the majority of us, I suspect if you've been able to handle the last four months, you're gonna be able to handle the uncertainty of grad school. Pessimism um, is another piece that contributes to our stress. Negative self-talk, this is that I'm not good enough, everybody else is better, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Those can add stress. And especially since you probably look for evidence of your negative self-talk, which reinforces the negative self-talk, and you probably aren't paying a lot of attention to the things that go against your self-talk. Unrealistic expectations. So. I have a lot of graduate students who come in and expect to be able to do the same grades that they did as an undergrad. Some of you will, some of you are gonna struggle more. 
not because you don't know the information necessarily, it's just a lot of stuff coming at you at one time. Perfectionism. Yeah, that, that I gave up at about my second paper as a, as a master's student. Lack of assertiveness. Internalizing criticism, that is a kind of goes with the negative self-talk. So these are common stressors. But is all stress bad? No. There is the eustress, use eustress. This type of stress, if you have a bell curve, we know that as um, anxiety increases, so does performance to a point. You stress is that area of the bell curve where your stress level is motivating, it's driving you, it's getting you to meet deadlines, it's being helpful. If we didn't have any stress, we're going to sit on the couch and be a potato and watch TV all day. This you stress is where we want you, it's in the zone. We want to help you get in the zone. What we don't want to happen is for you to go past the zone and into distress. And distress is what we usually refer to when people use the term, I'm stressed or I'm anxious. We're they're usually talking about they're over into the distressed area. This type of stress has negative effects both on our mental, our mental abilities and on our body. Um, you may be experiencing panic symptoms. You may not be in full panic attack, you might be. Um, you may experience racing heart, shortness of breath, muscle tension, I carry my stress here. You may experience shaking, sweating, dizziness. It goes up the up in severity. Um, this stress demotivates us. This is the stress we're talking about when all I want to do is take a nap instead of face what needs to be done. It also prevents us from thinking clearly and calmly. This is that sense of I'm overwhelmed, I can't do it, I don't even know where to start. So from here on, when we're talking about stress in this presentation, we're in the distress category. Most of the time, we do not see individuals who are in the eustress category. They're functioning pretty well, and honestly, that's where most grad students stay. Very few of you, in percentage-wise, really come over and talk to us because you're in the distress state for more than maybe a day or two. You know, all of us reach that state when we've got a deadline and we're trying to get do it but most grad students are able to stay in the eustress area. Here's that bell-shaped curve I was talking about. Um, so, you know, over uh, outside of that peak area, you're bored, you're fatigued, dissatisfied, it's a term rust out. Um, the eustress, again, it's creative, problem solving, satisfaction. This is that feeling you get where you've been working. So you've been over here without much stress, you were working on this paper, trying to get it started, and it's just not coming together. And now you've got a week before the deadline, and suddenly things are starting to click. You're in the eustress area. Distress, as I talked about, this is where things go downhill. Fatigue, exhaustion, um, poor health, breakdown, burnout, low self-esteem. We become sick, more sick more often, even sicker with the same events. Um, this is that point where those thoughts have stopped happening and you're sitting there going, I can't even type now. So, I've given you the bad news. Let's talk about the good news. We can cope with stress. First thing is avoid unnecessary stress. Learn to say no. You're going to have a lot of expectations, a lot of pressure. Realistically, most of us cannot do it all. At some point, learn to say no. Um, sometimes saying no is really hard, especially if it's, say, with our partner. You know, they want to go to a movie tonight. You've got a paper due in two days. Saying no is probably going to cause some relationship stress. So learning how to say no in a way that doesn't contribute more stress. So, you know, I really can't tonight. This paper's due Saturday. You know what? Saturday night, maybe we can do something after I finish the paper. So say no, give them another alternative. Um, learn to take control of your environment. You probably learned this in an undergrad where you study best, how you study best. 
those skills can, they're, they're with you. Use them now and try to reduce your to-do list. Um, whether that means saying no and taking stuff off, doing some little things that can get some things off really quickly. Try to keep it so that you're not feeling overwhelmed. If that doesn't work, try taking your to-do list to a shorter time period. What do I have to do today versus my list for the entire month? So work on keeping that to-do list manageable and helpful, not stressful. Alter your situation. Um, express your feelings instead of bottling them up. And this doesn't mean you have to go on a tirade or a rampage. It means using I statements. I feel overstressed when you ask me to do too many things at one time. Um, do, you know, being able to express it. Being willing to, willing to compromise. I kind of gave a little bit of example of that with the previous slide in where your partner wants to do something, you really can't because you've got a deadline, but being able to come to a time when maybe you both can. Be more assertive, that saying no. Um, one of the things I hear frequently and causes a lot of the graduate students that we do see to come over, now keep in mind we see a small percentage, but of those who do come over, one of the biggest issues is with their advisors, with their professors, their faculty members who are doing this hurry up and wait where you're turning in the paperwork because you've got a deadline, you get it done, you get it done, and then you don't get feedback until two days before it has to be done, and so now you're having to hurry up again. Talking to your professors, talking to your advisors, how can we adjust this? I know you're busy, however, I can't always get this done. Manage your time differently. Um, and this is, you know, we can't change your professor. Maybe it means you clear the two days before the next deadline because you know that's probably when you're gonna get the stuff back from your professor to do it. So adjusting, flowing to the situation. Adapt to the stressor. Reframe it. Um, it's really difficult when you get your first paper, whether it's a lab report, a um, editorial, a research paper, and it has got a lot of markups on it. Because remember, what they expect is going up a little bit. You could look at it as, oh my gosh, I did horrible. There's no way I'm ever going to pass. I used to get better grades. I can't believe the professor hated it. The other way to look at that is your first paper. Of course you're going to not do as well. You use the feedback. This is great feedback the professor's giving you. And if he doesn't or she doesn't, go back to that assertiveness from the previous one and ask them for constructive feedback. Use it as a learning opportunity. Use it as a way to improve so the next time you do better. Also look at the big picture. You know, maybe you gotta be on it. How important is your GPA once you have your master or doctorate, especially the doctorate where you're not going to be applying for another grad school or another program? Look at the big picture. You know, maybe you got to be on this one, but you're going to do three others for the, for the course, and they're all equal. If you make A's on all of them because you use the feedback, you're probably going to do okay in the class. Adjust your standards. Going back to that perfectionism. As much as we would like to, it's really, really difficult for everything to be perfect, especially with the deadlines you'll be experiencing in grad school. So adjust what is perfect or adjust what is good enough and focus on the positive. You made a B, you passed. Or, you know, the professor really liked this part of what I did. I need to work and improve over here, but he was really happy with, they were really happy with this. Focus on the positives. Accept the things you cannot change. I know we hear this all the time. Um, please don't try to control the uncontrollable. As much as we would like to, as much as we would like for you to be able to, unfortunately, we cannot change professors. And some professors are just anxiety-producing machines. 
learn to control that you learn to accept that you can't control them you're not going to be able to change the professor probably not the first graduate student they've had this ex feeling the way you're feeling so we're going to have to work on helping you adjust look for the upside which we talked about earlier again share your feelings and learn to forgive yourself more importantly than any of the others anyone else Forgiveness is something we do to help ourselves, not to help other people. If we hang on to the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the sadness, we're only hurting ourselves. The other person is not being hurt. They're not experiencing these feelings. These feelings aren't keeping them from being able to do what you want to do. They're not keeping them from sleeping. They're, it's not affecting your professor, let's say. It is, however, affecting you. So learn to forgive for your sake. I'm not saying forget. And I'm not saying that you're not right. What I'm saying is let it go. Okay, yeah, frozen quote there. Um, let it go so that it doesn't keep impacting you. Make time for fun and relaxation. Remember I said that busy, busy schedule? Part of what it will, what you'll need, what will help to get through grad school is scheduling, putting it in your schedule, relaxation time, set it aside, protect it if at all possible, connect with others. I said earlier, you know, if you've got a professor, a um, advisor who's giving you a rough time, you're probably not the first student who's had that. Talk to other people in the lab. Get to know people in your classes. You're all going through the same experience to a degree. You're all in the same classes. You're all having to adjust to grad school. Maybe your outside things are different, but lean on each other. Do something you enjoy every day, even if it's just five minutes. Even if you can only do five minutes. Do something you enjoy every day. Keep your sense of humor and share it. Um, sometimes the only thing we're going to be able to do is just laugh it off. Adopt a healthy lifestyle. Um, this is another one. Remember, you're busy. Exercise regularly. Exercise does not have to mean two hours at the gym, okay? Yes, the rec center is wonderful, and please use it if you have time. Exercise may mean parking as far away across campus as you can, and walking to class, to your lab, upstairs. Avoid the hundred and something plus day weather days of doing that, but building it in to your routine where you're not happy to take in a huge chunk of time out of your day, because most of you are gonna find that if you try to do a huge chunk, it's not gonna work, and then you're gonna become frustrated that you're not exercising. So work it into your day. <clears throat> Eat a healthy diet. Yes, I know it is so much easier to grab fast food on the way in than preparing your lunch the night before. <clears throat> if you do have to grab fast food, try for a healthier option. Um, keep healthy snacks, nuts. Um, granola's got a lot of sugar, but keep nuts, cheese, if you have a refrigerator local, um, some healthier type of options to eat. Reduce your caffeine and sugar. Uh, yeah, that's ideal. Well, let's be honest. You're a graduate student, and there are going to be days that you're not going to survive without your caffeine. So try to keep it to a moderate level. Sugar, though, you can work on reducing. Yes, sugar gives you that burst of energy, and it gets you through. However, the issue is, is once you come off of that burst of energy, you're going to be even lower than you were originally, which means you're going to need more sugar to get the next burst. Better to use some longer protein-type foods for that burst of energy, um, jerkies, nuts, cheeses, um, protein shakes, Something that digests slower and will give you a steadier level of energy versus these up and downs. Avoid alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs in excess. Um, let's be honest. It's been a rough week. It's Saturday night. You want a beer. I'm not saying don't have a beer. Okay? But don't be drinking to the point you're drunk every night. Use it in moderation. Avoid excess. 
Um, be aware <clears throat> with the cigarettes that UTSA is a smoke-free campus. And the reason for that, and it seems like they, this doesn't get out very often, is we've got a multi-million dollar grant from the National Health Organization, and that grant is dependent on us staying smoke-free. So please be courteous of the money coming in and please obey the no smoke um, signs on campus. What you do at home, I'm not gonna tell you yes or no. Really important, get enough sleep. Um, I know we tend to do all nighters. We tend to stay up late, get up early. Sleep snowballs everything. The less sleep we have, the less energy we have to do the strategies that we need to keep going. Um, don't get enough sleep. We get up early, we're feeling tired. We may not exercise that day. We may park closer to our, cla our class or our lab just to get there and not have to walk. Probably not gonna have the energy that night to make a healthy meal. So sleeps, if any one of these, I can give you this being the most important. The big one to watch is the sleep. Again, going back, take time to connect with yourself and others. <clears throat> you know, others, let me define others here. Others for us, for you, are people who do not cause you stress, okay? So unhealthy relationships with family, friends, minimize those, increase time with people who are supportive, who are fun, that you enjoy being around. So when we talk about connecting with others, that's what we're meaning, not just everybody, but people who are, are helpful. Connect with yourself. The person going into your undergrad pro program is more than likely not the person sitting here today watching this video. The person you are today is not gonna be the same person you are when you finish your program. A lot of the growth, a lot of the change from graduate programs is internal. Yes, you're getting information. What the work during grad school is, is more internal accepting your limits, identifying your strengths, becoming in your mind that professional. Learn to connect, take some time and look inward. So some prevention, I've kind of hit about on all these, but these are more, more specific things. Know your limits, listen to your body. Um, I knew when I was overstressing myself in grad school because in Inevitably, I would get a cold. <clears throat> Don't know how that virus kept getting back in, probably different strains, but I would get sick. I would have cold type symptoms. Fortunately, not flu, not severe, but I would have cold type symptoms. Time management is a key. Um, limit the stressful things in your life as possible. We talked about that earlier. Um, Plan ahead for the stressful times. Know the times in your semester when it's gonna be more stressful. Um, if you've got a paper due for a conference, um, finals time, big assignments due, projects. Know when those are and plan. Let people in your life know, you know what? <clears throat> I have a conference paper due on October 16th. Two weeks before that, beginning and beginning of October, I'm sorry, but I, I'm just going to have to barricade myself in my office and work on it. Prepare. Let people know. Do things ahead. You know, if you know that you're going to have a stressful time, you know, maybe make some healthy meals early on and freeze them. But plan ahead. Um, be aware of your own self-talk. This is things like, I don't want to do this. I really hate this. Look at the bigger picture. How does this fit into things? Be compassionate and patient with yourself. It's going to be different. It's going to be in many ways difficult. You're making it. Remind yourself of that. Yes, this is hard. I've made it this far. You made it to grad school. Acknowledge what you can and cannot do and can and cannot control. 
practice stress management and relaxation before you need it. So why do we do that? Why do we practice before? For two reasons. One, if we practice continually, it keeps our baseline anxiety down. Also, our reaction time, our physical reaction time is quicker if we have been practicing it than if we have not. Um, so let me give you an example. For example, I have, I'll share a little, I'm phobic of flying. I hate flying, just don't do it well. And so I use diaphragmatic breathing when I'm getting on an airplane. Well, I quit practicing that. I quit doing it except when I was getting on an airplane. So guess what happened? My body said, hmm, you only do this now, so your anxiety must even be higher, and it quit working. So be careful, do it more often. I have gone back to doing my breathing three or four times a week. So what happens when you do get into that distressed area when, and you stay there? It's not temporary, it's not moments or a day or so, but it becomes your normal state. It's probably an indication that you may be experiencing an anxiety disorder. If you think about staying in that distressed state long enough, your body's going to wear out. It's going to get tired, and you are probably likely to start becoming depressed. Some of you, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it is a high percentage that some of you have experienced some trauma in your past. Either you're programmed by the nature of it or by the stress of it may very well interact with those past traumas to make your stress even higher than it would normally be. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder. If it becomes more than stress, if you are stuck in that distress state, you start becoming depressed, past events start becoming bothersome to the point you really can't make it go away in your mind, you can't focus, this is the time to come talk to us. We can help with this. When it has reached the point it's impairing you socially, relationships, your job with your academics, actually try to come to us before it's really bad. Um, so that we can help you get back on track sooner. So where is us? We are Counseling and Mental Health Services. We are in the Rec and Wellness Center, which I know you don't know the campus yet, but we are connected in a way to the Rec Center and the Rec Center is really big. However, this year, 2020, 2021, at least the fall semester, we are primarily uh, Zoom is how we're doing our sessions. So you can give us a call at 4140 is the extension. It's 210-458-4140, option two. Again, 210-458-4140, option two. Normally I put a handout here. I don't have that for you. That same number, 210-458-4140, option three. Three is our 24-hour crisis line. If you are in the midst of a panic attack, that's the one you want to call us. The two is the option three because you're going to be able to talk to someone immediately. If you're calling to set up an appointment, maybe you need to talk to somebody, but it's not critical. Do the option two. Um, so now let's talk about some things I. I Recommended that you do some relaxation st strategies pretty regularly. So here is a list of some of the more common ones. Diaphragmatic breathing. I mentioned that earlier. That is something that I do frequently. Um, if I had you in person, which I usually do, so I'm going to have to try this with video, I would ask everybody to take a deep breath. So I'm going to ask you to do that anyway. So take what you think is a deep breath. You've probably had time to do it. If your shoulders and your chest moved, you took a big breath. When we talk about a deep breath, we are talking about getting down into the diaphragm. That's why it's called diaphragmatic. Um, a good exercise to start to learn diaphragmatic breathing, 
um, is to put one chest, one hand on your upper chest, one down in that V under your rib cage. Keep the hand and shoulders up here still while making your stomach blow up like a balloon. Um, there's a lot of exercises, counting, square breathing, all of the stuff you can find online. I recommend working on your own pace, figure out what works for you. Personally, I don't do well with the numbers. I'm more of a guided imagery type with my breathing. I imagine breathing in cool, calm, breathing out, hot, stress, whatever works, play with it. Find what's natural for you. Really, really popular in the last few years, really good for helping with anxiety is mindfulness exercises. And again, there's a wide, wide variety of them. Just do a Google search on mindfulness and you will get a lot of them. Guided imagery is kind of like meditation, but instead of it happening on your own, you're listening to somebody. The more popular, more common ones are people guiding you through imagining that you're at relaxing places, the beach, a lake, the mountains, a stream, forest, that sort of thing. Uh, again, lots of them, do a Google search, find the ones that you like. Pick the ones. There are some out there that a lot of people really like and the voice bothers me. Use the ones that you like. Um, progressive muscle relaxation. This is more for people who are experiencing muscle aches. It is literally tightening and releasing the muscles. Tightening and releasing the muscles. Um, personal preference, some, some of them start head down. Some start feet up. Um, I personally like the feet up because that my feet and legs don't carry my stress as much and so they relax easier and my more stressful areas they're done last. Meditation is the one that you don't utilize an external source. This is that sense of calming. One of the things with meditation, um, if you are like most of us, your brain's not going to shut up. It's going to keep going. So looking at meditation <laughs> guidelines, learning that meditation, figuring out meditation is not a stopping our brain. It's more of stopping us trying to control our brain. Um, and there are some helpful resources out there on how to meditate. Yoga, Tai Chi, Qi Kong, these are slow moving type of exercises that can help relieve stress. Exercise in and of itself can help relieve stress. Affirmations, you're capable, well, put them in the I phrase. I'm capable, I'm smart enough, I can do this, I've survived worse. Anything that can help you. There are, again, you can download affirmations. Doing something you enjoy, uh, listening to the radio, okay. Listening to your music on your phone. Yes, I just dated myself. Um, I will tell you, since the beginning of COVID, I used to read uh, between sessions when I needed that two minutes just or whatever to, call, to quiet down. I would read news stories. I've had to stop. The news is just too, too much right now. So I've switched over to Pinterest. And my favorite thing is to look at memes. I do that for a couple of minutes. Um, watching video, do the short ones, listening to a TED talk, do something that you enjoy. Um, so that is the end. Thank you for bearing with me with this. If you have any concerns, any questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, again, my name is Dr. Hazel Lane but there's a lot of skilled clinicians over here who can help you. Also, you know, you don't necessarily have to wait till you're in the distress level. If something is giving you a hard time and you want to work on prevention, also come and talk to us. We do have um, biofeedback programs here. We'll see what they're doing in the fall. Um, so thank you and goodbye.